Go ahead. It's now Jane. quarter till 11. No, it is <laughs> 417. Okay. This meeting is being called to order at 417. And let me call Ro. Elizabeth. Here. Jean, I'm here. <laughs> Lynn is absent. All right. So um, the first thing we need to do is approve the minutes. Did you see the I minutes? have read the minutes and I'm ready. Oh, then I guess we need a, a motion. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes from July, it, July 17th. 17th. And I will second the motion. So let's have a vote. All in favor, raise your hand. <laughs> All right. Unanimous okay. minutes. Very right. nice. Okay. So now public comment. Thank you all for coming. Do any of you want to say anything? Maybe I can go first. Oh, no, I'm good. Okay. I make lots of okay. go. I want them to go first. I'm just going to wait. I like to be at the end. Oh, sure. Um, I'll just say something quick. I did write a letter over the summer. I'm Brittany Cooley, by the way. Um, I have two girls at Four Corners, one in third grade, one in kindergarten, um, and I've been a Greenfield resident for almost 12 years. Um, I wrote a letter over the summer um, because, you know, you got, we are changing the plans, hopefully getting fifth grade back to the um, elementary schools. Um, and one of the things I've heard about is whether students who are choosing to elementary schools will be able to stay at those choice schools or if they'll need to go back to their designated home schools. So I wrote a letter explaining just some reasons why I'd be in support of allowing choice students to stay in the schools that they've been in. My daughter Charlotte being in third grade, she, you know, her last year of preschool was interrupted by COVID. She started kindergarten um, remotely and then returned to in-person learning. I believe it was in April of that year. Um, so really disjointed, um, very unusual kindergarten start, but she's had a really wonderful three years at Four Corners. Um, and my husband and I were really intentional about um, exposing our now five-year-old to kindergarten at Four Corners, taking her to meetings and you know, bringing her with us to pick up my daughter after school. And so she already knows all the staff um, and I really would love to see her stay at Four Corners also. So just a general um, vote to grandfather those kiddos in, if possible, um, and wanted that to be known. I don't, I'm, I'm Sarah Robertson Lentz. Uh, Wait, I, can you spell that? <laughs> Sarah Lentz, L-E-N-T-Z. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I am a new Greenfield resident as of May, so I don't have a ton to add to the conversation, mostly coming to listen and to learn but I am in support also of uh, the middle schools of fifth grade going back to the elementary schools, but I don't know if that's the topic that we're talking about today. I'm mostly <laughs> here just to, to find out more. That's that's part of it for sure. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, my name is Lindsay Patterson. I've been a Greenfield resident for almost two years. My son Emmett goes to Federal Street School and he's in fourth grade, so I, I'm here to become more informed because it's a topic that I've been thinking about for a long time, really feel that it is developmentally essential for the fifth grade to move back into the elementary schools. And I want to learn more about that timeline and advocate for it to happen as, as soon as it can, hopefully for next year so my son can stay in his school. Um, and yes, I'm just looking to learn more about it so that I can just be more knowledgeable and help other parents become more knowledgeable as well because I think that there's not a lot of clarity, at least among the teachers, the parents that I've talked to, in terms of knowing what's going on in the timeline. Mm -hmm. Oh, is it my turn? You're at I'm Melissa. Uh, I have a fifth grader at GMS and I feel that I've been talking about this because I wanted my fifth grader not to move to GMS. However, I know this is a public comment that we've had so far, we're a month in and I've had an amazing experience so far with GMS and all of my fears, let me tell you, all of them thankfully have been um, brushed aside because I had many of them as a parent. I have just, we spent a lot of time on this, there's lots of different options. And I just want to make sure that we are looking at everything from 
transportation to what we are doing that's best for all of our students, not just a select few and not just disturbing one particular group of kids. Um, I just want everyone to have the same access to the best education, no matter where they live or what their income is. And I think that's something I've said from day one. And I don't want, this has been a four year process. This hasn't been a one year process or two year. We're like four years in now. Um, so I don't want to see us just, or see you guys say, oh yeah, yeah, we're just gonna go with 2B um, when Star Committee did a whole report saying we can't physically put fifth graders back into the middle school or back into the elementary school years ago with the way the numbers were. So unless we reopen Green River. So I just like to see, you know, and I can tell you my daughter is loving the fact that she has a whole new group of friends. They're called the Kindness Club. <laughs> and the kids in her little Kindness Club, I mean, Michelle Van Noor was just here, we could ask her about it. <laughs> mm -hmm. But the Kindness Club is not just girls from Newton with MJ, there's some Federal Street girls, there's some um, kids from Four Corners. And I, as a parent, am like, as much as option one isn't everyone's favorite, I wonder what her friendships would be looking like had she had those friends from kindergarten, from first grade forward. I just wonder, and I know we talk a lot about transportation. Right now I'm doing three drop-offs at different schools within a 10 minute time frame. Um, I go from Newton, pick up a kid at Newton because his mom works there, and I drop him off at Federal Street School, and I go from Federal Street School to get here before 7.45 to get MJ to school on time. So I know it can be, can be done if parents are willing to work together and make it happen. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so now we're ready to start talking about. All right. So, last we left it. So, I'll recap a little bit. The, the pieces that we. Okay, the piece, it's a, it's a little cart. <laughs> um, the pieces that we had talked about last meeting that we still need to resolve is one, the. Um, resolution of the intra-district choice um, that so as I had talked about last time there we don't have the exact numbers but when Jake ran um, the transportation I'll call it the um, you know the I don't know hypo hypothetical um, to see what would transportation look like with the different options um, one of the pieces that happened was he literally combed through all of the students to make sure that when he routed for option 2b all the students were routed to the what would be their home school um, I do again I don't have this exact numbers because we would have to have Jake go back through and comb through 1400 students um, but there does seem to be a little bit of a misperception that it's only a few students that are intra-district choice at this point, and that's not the case. There are, a f there's, there's quite a number. I don't think it would be a stretch to say probably 40, if not, if not more, but Jake maybe can see, I don't know. Um, but there's not just a few. It's not, we're not talking about four or five students. It's, it's more of that. Um, so the reasons that we talked about potentially um, having everyone go back to their neighborhood school, let me back up and clarify, the timeline is, has been, we've been very, um, I felt like we have been clear, but you're saying there's some confusion, but that it would be September of 24. So this upcoming September, we didn't want to rush, we wanted to make sure that we could think about everything. Um, so that would be the target is for next September. Um, when we look at the enrollment that we have now and the physical space that we have now, we can in fact fit everybody. So that's been looked at. Elementary principals, myself and Karen sat and took maps of every building and said, okay, if we have two of every grade level, where would they potentially go? If we have three of some grade levels, where do they go? So we did that. That's why the conversation about intra-district choice came up because if we leave students 
who are choiced in the grades where they are four corners would have to have three third grades three fourth grades three fifth grades until those students age out so um, what that does is create a scenario where we have space limitations and the way to address those space limitations is to take a special education program that has more physical space that they require and swap it with a special education program that requires less physical space. So a program at Four Corners would have to move to Newton, a program from Newton would have to move to Four Corners. The other option, or the other potential, is that some of our teachers, primarily art and music, would not have classrooms at Four Corners. They would need to be on a cart. So they would literally have like a little squeaky cart that just went by in the hallway and go between classrooms with whatever materials they could have to deliver instruction in classrooms because Four Corners would run out of space. So the goal with um, looking to not continue on with the intra-district choice piece was primarily to not have any impact on those two special education programs. Secondarily was to ensure we had space for students to participate in the elective subjects um, in a more appropriate or more uh, comprehensive way than teachers moving um, materials on a cart. So that is the first thing, school committee. You have a question, okay. clarification. So if we take the intro cho choice students out of four corners, mm -hmm. would there then be two, two of each class instead yes. of three? Based on the numbers that we had at the time, which we believe still hold, um, it would mean, so I want to be clear too, there are intra-district choice kids that have choiced into every school in the district. So that would mean taking students from all of those schools and putting them into the neighborhood <coughs> schools. Um, what that would result in is two sections of every grade level in all three elementary schools. And it would not disrupt special education. It would not disrupt those two programs, correct. So, okay, that's yeah. it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, the, so that, that's one piece and actually the, um, we've added a discussion of this and a decision by the school committee hopefully on Wednesday night at the school committee meeting about this issue because the issue of the intra-district choice um, impacts classroom and impacts staff movement and those are the next two critical pieces that need to be dealt with. Um, I'm not able to meet with our unions and make plans about um, addressing staff displacement until I know what the numbers would look like. So the intra-district choice decision has to be the first thing that gets settled. Good so far? It's Elizabeth and Jean. Um, so. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm trying to, sorry, I'm just, one of the things that I really was hoping to see was a transportation comparison between option one and option two B. I know that you had said that option one seemed really untenable transportation wise yep um have you done any um is is that just the end of the conversation like it just cannot be possible and we can't collect data on, on well, we it? had presented about um jake do you still have i know there was discussion about what option one it was uh k1 two K3, three four yeah. five the bands in different schools essentially it was every school would need to have significantly like 15 minutes um, 15 minute differences or we would have to add a substantial number of buses because this, the buses as we as are currently that we currently have can't obviously be in two places at once and if we want to keep it so that they're picking up kids mm -hmm. in a geographic area then they have to um, be able to you know go to one school have a staggered start time and factoring in traffic and things like that it's like it would be you know 15 minutes between schools I'm asking because I feel like I've identified something in the two years that I've been on the committee and that is that we have members of the public coming to us like you and saying I'm kind of confused about how all of this is playing out 
and even though we've had all of our meetings and our minutes, having the minutes, just having the minutes, is a lot of labor to ask the public to go through, and not everybody can watch the meetings, and not everybody can attend. So I've been feeling like we need to maybe show our work a little bit more. So that's something that I'm going to try to talk about this year and next year. And so in this particular situation with redistricting, we've done so much work. But to have the public say that they might be confused, I wish that we could have some sort of document sort of similar to, and I know this is like a lot of work, similar to the strategic planning document, which was so brilliant because it really showed all of the steps. We should have a document like that for this process so that the parents can see why option one is not possible. So there's no so question. So everyone can really get behind what we need to get behind, it seems like. So I guess I, um, no. And I'm going to say only because um, we talked about the options and these pieces at school committee meetings. Right. And updates have been put on the website and they've stayed there. And I'm not sure that it would be less laborious for folks to read that document than it would be to read minutes. Interesting. Okay. So um, happy to recap everything Wednesday night at the school committee meeting without question. Mm -hmm. um, and if the whole committee wants a document laid out, then mm -hmm. obviously we'll do that. But I'm, I guess, being sensitive to the fact that you're saying reading minutes would be a lot. So I guess that's the piece where I'm, I'm just not sure how, how it is different to read a, a document that would be set out like the strategic plan. But whatever the committee would like. So um, it's just something that I think we're going to have to work on in the future. And so when we do these kinds of projects, we really do need to create a document or a form that we add to as we go through this work so that people can refer to it and see where we are in the timeline, what the timeline is. Nobody should have to ask, ask like when this is happening. It should be really easy for them to access. So I do, and that's just like, that's just how things are done now. And I, it just bothers me that I can't find this information easily and that it's not all in one place. So that's why. I'm, I, people have asked me, why not option one? What's going on with the transportation with that? And I literally cannot say, you know, go on the website because there's information exactly about this in this place written down so that you can access it. Like, I haven't seen that. So I'd like to see all of that come together in one space. I think it would be really helpful because this is going to be a big leap for the parents and they're all going to have to make adjustments. Everyone's going to have to shuffle around. And if we don't want to have any rancor and frustration and you know we already talked in the beginning that not everyone's going to be happy about this some people are mm -hmm. going to be really devastated and frustrated we have to have a little bit of a package for people to be able to slide into and read and i just think that that's just kind of some basic good business well, that we could, should do could you please uh prepare uh where they would go to look yeah, that would be because great. Because that's maybe what the missing piece is, that Elizabeth doesn't know where to go look. Sure. So was Jake able to answer the question about transportation option one? Yeah, now I really understand something that I didn't know before about this 15-minute intervals and that you'd need more buses. Okay. So Jean, Elizabeth, any other questions about so far? Okay, so then the next things that we needed to do would be to look at the elementary special schedule. Right now, the elementary special schedule is a little bit um, atypical. We actually have um, an agreement with the union to allow it to be atypical, and a piece of that is related to just how many sections of classes that we have. And I'm sure parents are well aware that we split elective teachers across buildings. Um, so we looked at the configuration for a K to five across all three elementary schools to see if it was doable with the um, elective teachers that we have now. And if there are two sections of every grade at all three elementary schools, we have the staff that we would need to cover those and they would be able to have a schedule that follows the requirements in the contract without any agreements with the union to modify that. So the staff the elective staff that we have at the elementary level would be sufficient to cover electives for two sections of every grade at three schools. So that that's one piece. If we had three sections of electives at four corners, 
we would have to potentially hire a partial person two sections right that would be two be two, two or th and a little or three yeah. and a little yeah <laughs> so it's a little bit of a person not quite a half but more than none so a little bit of a, a person would have to be hired to provide the appropriate number of sections to cover electives if we had three sections um, then we needed to look at the change of schedule for the middle school and there were two pieces that were being um, considered a, sort of a good time to look at a schedule change because um, the Department of Ed is doing a pilot for a history um, civics MCAS which will affect eighth grade and at this point the middle school does not teach science and social studies for a full year so given the um, pilot we really feel like we need to move to a full year of history and the fact that MCAS is um, taken in science as well at the eighth grade level we need to have a full year of science so that was a schedule change being discussed um, even prior to this but we really need to make a shift now um, so with a schedule for six seven eight we would need let me find it i i know you have it can i ask another question christine yes um so you're saying that the special schedule was atypical and is now are you saying it's now going to become typical or it's going to remain atypical and what does atypical mean okay so I'm trying to, that's going to pull up the staff and yeah. Um, so it is currently atypical and it was atypical last year in that um, the special teachers, um, the union on behalf of the special teachers agreed to have a change for last year and this year where their preparation minutes are broken up in the contract. It says they have to have 46 minutes of prep um, mm -hmm. to make the specials schedule work so that all of the kids got all of the elective subjects and all of our classroom teachers got preparation period and that we had grade level collaboration times which mm -hmm. has been really important i think karen's talked about it in connection right. to our academic work to make all that happen the specials teachers agreed to split up their prep time so some days they don't have prep time some days they have a little bit of prep time some days they have longer but it's mm -hmm. atypical in that way so if we go to two sections of each grade at all three elementary schools they will have 45 minutes of prep consecutive their schedule will look like they expect it so to we'll look. have actual time management time it it we'll will the time be that they need. um chopped up yeah it'll okay. be their daily prep consecutive minutes as opposed to sort of this chopped up schedule that hmm. they have now. That sounds like a positive change to me. Um, they've been really agreeable to the, like they've been understanding about the chopped up, but I think 46 mm -hmm. minutes is, you know, certainly much more efficient. Let's them do better. Yeah, your more. brain isn't it's just all over the place. Well, starting and stopping is, mm -hmm. is yes. challenging. Mm -hmm. Okay, so middle school. Thank you. Welcome. She made it big enough for me to see too. That's <laughs> very nice. So, assuming that we have um, six, seven, eight, we need an English, math, science, social studies teacher for each team. So, grade six, grade seven, grade eight would each have two teams, which is consistent with um, six and seven now. Mm -hmm. Fifth grade has three teams, but that. Mm -hmm. um, so, what that results in is that we would need to add a science we need to have two teachers at each grade level for the middle school so we don't end up with enough right now because social studies is a half year one of our history teachers teaches team a for half year and team b for the other half of the year mm -hmm. and the science teacher takes the opposite so if we need a full year of science and a full year of social social studies we need more teachers to do that so we need six additional staff okay Mm -hmm. Okay, so that assumes all of the current teachers remain, and then we have six blank spaces. Well, technically we have seven blank spaces, because um, to make sure that elective sections at the middle school are of reasonable size, we would be adding a PE teacher 
Um, so it's technically the seventh, but I can I can fill that gap in a second. Um, if we don't, then because all students have to have health and PE, those are requirements. Mm -hmm. So that's why the discussion about health and PE. There would be a rotation of the other electives, which include art, drama, STEM. STEM sorry, I'm forgetting all of my my classes, um, library. We um, anticipated adding Spanish for eighth grade and general music and then students who want band we still expect they'd be able to get band so okay mm -hmm. all right so that's we need seven at the middle school when I talked about the change at the elementary I need to go back for a second um, moving all of the students and the changes in enrollment and all of the moves would result in six sections at the elementary school being eliminated. However, most, if not all, but most I'll go with elementary teachers are licensed K through grade six. Mm -hmm. So there is potential for movement. Um, we also know that there will be some preference among the teachers that are already at middle school, teachers that are in eighth grade who might come to the middle school. So we expect there might be some requests for transfers within. Some people might want to go to the open eighth grade, open seventh grade positions. So um, I'm not going to say that six teachers would lose their jobs. We expect we would have um, space for several. Um, but I don't want to speak any further to that. Like I can't guarantee there won't be any staff who leave um, mm -hmm. because of loss of positions, but we have six um, positions at the elementary that look like they would be eliminated, but we know we have at least six classroom teachers at the middle school that would be open positions. And, and what about the high school? Um, okay. <laughs> so so the, going to the high school. Okay. And yes. Eighth grade teachers would go to the middle school. So we plan assuming that. Now I have my. Have you taken scratch. the temperature on any of this? Like, do have people said like, oh yeah, maybe we I would not, do that? No, we have. Um, wait a minute. Ask that question again. Like, have, have you just sort of casually taken the temperature of what maybe these? teachers the would feel like, preference. yeah, like, do you think that they'd go, because I, my worry is that, oh, that you, when we make these changes, and then they're like, no way, I'm out, and then we're stuck with, like, this. Uh, yep, I understand that. Um, so, last time we had a meeting, I mentioned the survey that the right. staff had done. I, I thought it was 89%. It's, it's 85% of all staff. Now, that includes custodians, cafeteria, administrative assistants. Everyone had access to the survey. Um, at least 85% of them clearly chose option 2B. Mm -hmm. There were a few people who chose option 1. Um, and um, the comments primarily, there weren't a lot of comments that were shared by the staff. If I were to categorize them, the majority of the comments were concerns about moving the special ed programs because of space. Um, so other comments were in support of one model or the other, which they had sort of already voted on anyway. Mm -hmm. So um, I have talked with the union at least twice. Well, mm -hmm. I'm going to go back three times because before we even started talking about this, the first first meeting that was held, all the union presidents were invited to attend. We had three. Mm -hmm. So we did that. And then since then, I have talked with the GEA president, so she represents mm -hmm. teachers and IAs. Yep. Um, we've talked several times about sort of how this process would go. So once the school committee makes a decision, then the next thing would be to sit with the teachers and say, you know, I'll have to sit with the union and, and we'll agree to how the process is going to go. But that would be like the first step. People would have opportunity to sit like I'd meet with the fifth grade teachers mm -hmm. meet with the eighth grade teachers so in order to let that that opportunity happen we really need to talk about it on Wednesday with the full committee so that we can open the door to even it's sort of 
you know, it, it's um, like a chicken and egg, I think. Yeah. It's kind of hard. If there's no decision to talk about, then it's all hypothetical, but it'd be nice to talk to see about a decision. So it's sort of yeah. either, you know, either way, if you, if, if you two would prefer that I offer voluntary meetings with fifth grade and eighth grade before next Wednesday, I'm happy to do that, um, see what they think. I, I can just revisit with the union president again. I, you know, I clearly it's going to have an impact, and there we're going to give them the opportunity to talk about it. But whenever I would, I would say let's let the school committee vote mm -hmm. on Wednesday, and then you okay. talk. Okay, you both would prefer that. Yes. Let's let yeah, that happen it first. Like we need to get this door open for you, so you can do your work. Okay, that's fine. I will do it whichever way. Okay, so high school. What we did was. Um, look at the enrollment current 8th current 9th current 10th current 11th current 8th is about 106 if I'm recalling we always work under the assumption that we will lose about 25 students about 20 percent to technical programs that's just that's just the way it historically goes we lose a percentage of students going into ninth grade um, to tech programs so we use that number in terms of estimating. So I sat with the two guidance counselors at the high school, Derek, myself, and went through, given the numbers, given all the required classes, um, how many sections of each class do we need? How many teachers do we have um, to look at staffing ratios? So for example, obviously every child needs to take English. The requirement is they take English all four years. So we need to make sure that we have enough. If it's 100 students, we want to keep class sizes around 20 to 25. I'm giving examples. This isn't you know, school committee policy or anything. It's just an example. Then we'd want to have five sections of English 9. So that's one teacher. So we went through that whole process. This is all, my, all the chicken scratch of all of this. Some of the things we needed to ensure. Students um, have to meet their graduation requirements. So making sure that we had all the sections that would be needed for everybody to get into all the English, all the math, the history, and the lab sciences that they need for graduation. Health and PE also for graduation. Language, also making sure students have access to language. Some colleges want four years of a language. Making sure we have access to that. Not reducing any sections of our AP courses because um, I know we don't want to reduce sections of AP, so making sure that we leave all of those in place. Making sure that um, we still offer a reasonable amount, reasonable amount of elective courses. So going through all of that, um, what it looks like is that we would have the ability to shift some staff from the high school um, to cover um, an open position at the middle school and then um, there it looks like we'd have to add all the kids actually into the master schedule to confirm all of this but it also looks like we would be able to not fill two open positions we have two positions now staff um, we don't have teachers in them right now they're either vacant or like they have subs so we could it looks right now like we could eliminate those two positions um, going into next year and then um, to ensure that we have all of our science and math high level elective courses I think we would need to hire um, a half-time history teacher so those things, do the, does that exist? I have reason to believe <laughs> we may. A history teacher out no, there? <laughs> I, I have reason to believe we may have the opportunity to have a half-time history teacher. But I don't want to say anything more specific until I get to talk to some people. So between the changes at the elementary, the changes at the middle school, and then the impact at the high school, I think it is um, neutral in terms of full-time staff equivalents or we actually end up with one or two less so my point being it's not it's not a good thing to have staff 
reductions, but in terms of impact on the overall budget, which we know we need to consider, um, there does not look to be any substantial impact. Like we're not looking to hire, you know, 10 more teachers or anything like that. Right. Feels like the schedule can accommodate the change. Transportation looks like we can accommodate the change, but Jake and I actually met with just, <laughs> I know, <laughs> I said looks like. We're not pinning anything on you yet. Um, we actually met with transportation folks today and talked again about the scenario and we agreed that if the school committee looks like they're going to be moving in the option of 2B, then um, we would try to what we call roll the year sooner, kind of make a fake schedule um, next year in the back of our student information system, sort of in the background, and load all the kids into the transportation software and let them look to see if the runs can be accommodated with the numbers of buses. And it actually works out rather nicely because this is the year we have to go out to bid for transportation again. So if there's an impact on transportation, this is the time to know it. So might we have fewer buses if everybody's in their neighborhood? Just no. Okay. <laughs> but we're hoping to not need more. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we're going to need less, but we're trying to not need more. Yeah, it's not essentially not without reconsidering the walk. If, if everybody that currently gets a bus got a bus, there would, there's no chance that it would be less. less. Yeah. Um, but you know the things that we're trying to think about um, offering some. Um, trying to still offer music at the elementary, which actually right now they don't have general music. This would allow um, two sections of general music every day. Um, it would allow eighth grade Spanish. It would um, fix the elementary specials, atypical schedule. I don't even know how to describe it other than that. Um, it would allow us to keep all of our um, I didn't say it, but all of the special ed services at the middle school, the high school would remain. Like we, there would be no impact um, on any of that. That is always driven, as you know, always driven by student numbers. I can't say whether in a year we'd need additional or fewer special ed teachers. That's always just driven by numbers. So that, but that, there would be no change, no movement of programs or anything in those regards. Um, we would need to look at caseloads for special education, how they shift. So some staff, such as counselors, speech pathologists, um, special education teachers, uh, you know, we always look at where the um, enrollment is for students who need those services and have to make decisions about where um, staff are placed. That's not unusual. We would just, again, have to do it. Um, our ELL program, we would look to leave things as they are. We have teachers in the program. We look at caseloads and assign staff accordingly. So all of that would be the same. I don't anticipate any before school program changes. Like we still are planning to offer the before school program. Um, you know, Christy with the rec department more than we're thrilled to keep having her do the after school program that she's been doing. We looked at staffing. I don't know what else I'm trying to think of what else. We looked at transportation. Um, I don't know. What else do we need to think about? What else can you think about? I mean, it seems like it's you. It seems like you've gone through everything. It seems I'm, like you've been very concise and, and thorough. So I think now it's time, right, for the committee to talk and to also maybe. That's where that concept of a form comes into my mind is to create, take all the things that we've learned, all the things that we've decided, put it together so that the community can accept it after we vote upon it and understand it. There was a, when the options were articulated, I don't know if I want to say it that way, there was a little table that was out. It's on the website. Mm -hmm. It's a table, three column. Mm -hmm. I can reproduce that 
but you said strategic plan document that that's very well that's bulky. massive and giant right if you're talking about reproducing something like the table that's on the website already with updated information yeah I can easily do that yeah I think something like that would be great so we can okay. say well we are gone on this journey and we've come to almost the end and here we all are together that can be done and I would also like to add that the Planning and Construction Committee, which I chair for the city, is actively pushing for a new elementary school. Well, that's great to hear, Jean. It, it <laughs> will take 10 years to have the money available and to do all of the planning, but at the moment, mm. the state pays 90% of the cost of a school. For us, it would. Yeah. Nice. So, I think if you if parents will start talking about how much they think an elementary school would matter, where all the children are in a school together, in a facility that is updated, et cetera, that that's what's in the back of my mind that the city needs for the future. Mm -hmm. Got to well, start somewhere. Like yeah, and we talked about like year one could be should be now. Yeah, and and it takes ten years. I mean, it took ten years to do the library, so I'm sure a school will be an equal amount of time. But we have to start on it now mm -hmm. instead of waiting till it's an emergency again. Okay, so nothing else. <coughs> you don't have any other questions. No. You don't have any other questions. That's great job. I feel good. Mm -hmm. You really did a lot of work. Thank you. I still feel like there's, I don't know, it must be transportation. <laughs> it must be Jake <laughs> that we're waiting for. We'll figure it out day one of whenever this starts. Like you we'll do every missed. year. Yep. I know. Yep. Um, I know we've really tried to think about like all the pieces. And Oh, the other question that was asked I'm looking at you because I'm wondering if you actually asked it last meeting. Um, what do we do with all the space left in the high school? I don't know. Maybe it wasn't you. Doesn't no, matter. I didn't ask that. I asked about Green River. Okay. Oh, okay. So at the high school, um, there will be some classes that are not you know, readily um, obvious what we use them for. But one of the things that we can reflect back with the NESDEC study is they talked about the potential for different elective classes. Um, potentially we could make, you know, some special ed programs have more space. We could split and use them, you know, different spaces for different elements of programs. So the biggest excitement I have is that reflecting that, you know, Karen and Derek at the high school and I have met with um, Michelle Schott, the president of uh, GCC and some of her staff and talked about um, setting up, I'm loosely calling it pathways, that's an official thing with the Perkins um, vocational, but setting up courses at our high school that would put students in a better position to get into and have familiarity with some of the programs at GCC. Are you talking about Beacon? No, okay. no, actually different. Um, so Beacon is a um, it's an alternative program for students. Um, I wasn't specifically talking about Beacon, but things like um, if they have an early childhood program at GCC, we could potentially look to add um, additional early childhood type classes, you know, child psychology or early childhood development, things like that as electives, mm -hmm. so that it's giving students more exposure to some of the types of programs that they have at GCC, mm -hmm. make it um, easier for them to think about college in some way. Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't specifically thinking about Beacon. That's actually Beacon a, is expanding. I was going to talk about it on Wednesday because I went to the meeting. Mm -hmm. It so. is CES program now. So, um, I don't know Green River. Know. Green River. We are we are looking to divest of Green River. Um, I'm not completely positive. I'd like to. Um, there has been some conversation with the mayor about um, options for that, but I'm not. Um, 
I'm not sure how much of that conversation there there are some folks talking to the mayor but I don't know how much of that is still sort of investigatory stage but um, I have to do all the paperwork to officially close it with the Mass School Building Authority um, which is going to take a fairly consecutive fairly quiet consecutive period of time to do um, but and I know I have talked about this um, somewhere previously, but the language in the contract that Mayor Martin signed speaks to that the building needs to be used for educational purposes for 50 years after the loan was signed. Um, and the loan was for just over a million dollars. The final audit of the project was in 2019 the last year that our student database shows students enrolled at Green River was 2018. And when they look at how much a district has to pay back of an MSBA loan, they look at prorating it from the date of the final audit until it was closed. And for us, there was no time between that. Um, I don't know, there is some language in the paperwork that makes me hopeful that if someone that if the future use is connected to education, we may get some grace from MSBA around that. Um, but I don't know that, and they won't tell me until I do all the paperwork, <laughs> um, and then see what if you know if whatever future use it has is educationally related to the degree that they would say close enough and skip it. I don't. I don't know that. In, in uh, Amy and I talked one day about perhaps if we're building a new school, they would forgive the loan to put it toward that. I mean, you know, there are lots yeah. of conversations we can have. Right. I think w when I met virtually with um, one of the directors from MSBA and one of the other people who work there, basically all the paperwork has to be done. We have to identify sort of next steps that we anticipate. Then they'll talk to us about maybe this, maybe that. But at this point, um, I know there's always talk about using Green River as an alternative school, using it as a special education school, which would be fantastic, but we still have to deal with the HVAC system, which is the issue that created some conversation prior to my arrival that was a million dollars three years ago. So it's no doubt significantly more than that. If we were to use it as a special ed school, we would have to do, do the HVAC, then we would have to upgrade all the technology, the plumbing, because the water's been off for three years. We'd have to inspect all the electrical. We would have to, depending the grades of students there, potentially would have to redo a playground. Um, we would have to do the security there. Um, it repaint, refurnish, it is not pushing a broom. It is not in a state where it could be moved into currently. Um, and then we would have to staff it. So if we have a special education program there, there would have to be an administrative assistant, a director, principal, overseeing administrator, a nurse, a counselor, teachers in every classroom, um, instructional assistants, and potentially at least a half time if not a full-time custodian. And that is recurring cost. So it's it's not a situation that I don't I don't think that's a situation that the school department can jump into right now. Unless you feel differently. If you guys well, want to go like we in should that just direction. Pretend like it doesn't exist. <laughs> Let's just pretend that building's not there for a while. I mean I, I appreciate that over time there could be a financial benefit to the district if that were a special <laughs> education program. I totally understand that. But the out you know, the upfront is well the city desperately needs office space. Well, so if we could use it for offices or housing mm -hmm. what it I, would it would satisfy another yeah, <laughs> need yeah. for yep. the city. The sad thing is um, the mayor shared that was the newest school in the district mm -hmm. that's what she had said so yeah it's a cute school and the gym a cafetorium is a beautiful room but mm -hmm. so it'd be nice if it's used for something 
<laughs> you know. So that's that's where we are. Anything okay. else? No, I'm, I'm good. I a feel motion like. to resign. <laughs> All right. It's, um, uh, a motion to adjourn. Adjourn, yes. A second. All right. 507. Aye. Okay. <laughs> Unanimous. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much.